Today on the All About Fitness podcast, we are talking with an expert on blood flow restriction, Dr. Jim Stray Gunderson. How are you doing today, Dr. Jim? I'm doing just fine. Thank you, Pete. Well, what's interesting is I have heard about blood flow restriction for years. And as I was prepping for this interview, I went back into a book that, that I had read maybe two or three years ago that had a little mention of, of BFR. And what was funny is, guess who was the expert quoted in that book? Hmm, I can't guess. <laughs> it was you. It was <laughs> you. Were, it was um, Jeff Rakovi's book. I think it was uh, it was uh, play, or it was on his book on yeah. science and how science is changing training. So it was kind of interesting of where here I am. I'm trying to prep for the interview. I go back, and it, the expert quoted is yourself. How did you first get involved in in studying blood flow restriction? Um. Good question. Um, so basically, blood flow restriction has been around for 50 years, and but centered in Japan. And it basically um, stayed in Japan until maybe after after the year 2000. And then it, then it started getting out into the West a little bit. Um, in my case, uh, my job with uh, the Olympic ski team and these athletes has been uh, to find ways to uh, legally and ethically enhance performance. And uh, um, I was introduced to uh, blood flow restriction training at uh, an American College of Sports Medicine meeting by a colleague of mine. Hmm. And one thing led to another, and I ended up going to Japan and uh, learning about it from the horse's mouth, if you will. And uh, uh, basically, Initially, I was skeptical. I, I didn't believe that the kind of results they were talking about. And, um, but I was open-minded enough to listen. And uh, so we started incorporating it with the groups that we were working with here in Park City. Well, I want to come back to that because I, I first heard, it's interesting, doctor, because I first, a colleague of mine had first told me about it maybe 15 years ago, sometime in the mid 2000s, was telling me kind of about using blood pressure cuffs or using pressure cuffs to induce hypertrophy. And in my mind, as a personal trainer, that seemed a little bit outside my scope of practice. Like anytime you start talking about occlusion, I start getting concerned about elevating blood pressure. And I think, you know what, that sounds more like a medical procedure. And I kind of like, that's something that as a personal trainer, it's if it's out there, cool, but I look at that as outside my scope of practice. So when looking at that, what exactly is involved with blood flow restriction training? How is that implemented? Yeah. So this actually you raise a good point. So um, one of the things is that this did get going around the mid 2000s in the West and they couldn't get a hold of the equipment that was being made in Japan. Mm. And so they just grabbed something that they thought looked like it. So um, really this was really first in the bodybuilding community and then in the power lifters, but with the bodybuilders, uh, they would put these bands on uh, before competition to get a really good pump going. And uh, their competitors saw this and said, hmm, that looks pretty cool. And then they went back, and this is in Europe and the States, and they went back and they tried to figure out something that was semi-like what they were seeing on these Japanese athletes. And uh, um, they got it wrong. So... Uh, <laughs> We have a whole thing, and it's usually used in physical therapy where they've been using blood pressure cuffs or surgical tourniquets to actually occlude blood flow into the extremity and then back off of that and find some level where they're getting some blood in there. But um, it's theoretic, it's conceptually wrong about how they're thinking about it and how they're going about it. And one of the things about, uh, uh, our form of uh, blood flow restriction training is that our devices are elastic. You know, when you put a blood pressure cuff on, uh, once it's on and the Velcro is attached, there's no give to it. So if the extremity under, contained underneath the, the cuff ends up expanding, like it, when you have a muscle shortened, when you contract a muscle, it gets fatter as well as stiffer. And also uh, if you get a pump going, then there's all of a sudden there's no more room. And that is an untoward situation that can cause a rise in blood pressure. And it can cause in, in some circumstances, uh, blood clots to form. 
and it just hurts. And so it's not really the, the way that that form of blood flow training has evolved in the West is really only uh, practical for uh, rehab settings where there's an expert that is sur supervising what's going on and they take a bunch of precautions. Um, but with the elastic uh, form of uh, BFR, uh, which is what Be Strong is, that, that's good for anybody. It's completely safe. Um, we've done a study where we looked at the changes in blood pressure from exercise, from walking on treadmills, uh, just normal walking versus an elastic cuff versus one of these uh, tourniquets. And the control walking and the, norm, and the elastic uh, bands ends up not raising blood pressure beyond what exercise alone does, where the one that um, is occlusive and is uh, what we call rigid, that ended up uh, shooting blood pressure way up. So um, there's a bunch of misinformation out there about uh, what is what, and if there's something that we can um, uh, kind of establish today, it's, it's that this elastic form of uh, um, uh, BFR is much safer, much simpler, and uh, is something that uh, personal trainers, strength and conditioning coaches, um, lay people, everybody, every, everybody can uh, utilize to good effect. Well, it's one of those things years ago, doctor, when I heard about it, I thought it was interesting and I looked into it a little bit and I'm like, I could see some of the mechanisms and I want to talk about the potential mechanisms in, in a few minutes here. But it was just one of those things where like, this looks cool, but it's a little bit, in my opinion, over my skis. But now that when I saw what you're doing and I saw, because you now have a, a personal trainer education program to go along with uh, what you're doing, correct? Yes, we do. We have a certain certification course and um, we're also uh, working with uh, uh, NATA to develop a series of online courses that can be taken by trainers for credit. And um, so there, there's a lot of this education that needs, that needs to happen and we've got some of it online already. Yeah, because my fear was if you start having people tie off so to speak, in the gym, without really understanding what they're doing. There's just, that's nothing good can come of that, in my opinion. Well, and, and they do that. Yeah. You know, you know, go down to Walmart and get a Cub Scout belt and strap it on. And there you go. <laughs> yeah. Now let's, uh, let's take, before, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into a deeper dive on some of the potential mechanisms of blood flow restriction. But first I want to talk a little bit about your background because you have a long extensive history in sports medicine, correct? Yeah. Um, well, it's it. Basically, I got into sports medicine and sports science before there really was such a thing. So um, I was trained as a general surgeon, have my boards in general surgery. But after my surgical residency, I went down to uh, University of Texas at Southwestern in Dallas and did a, a, a one postdoc fellowship in human nutrition and another one in cardiovascular physiology. And uh, from that, I ended up joining the faculty and being uh, running a human performance center. Okay. And so I really had kind of stopped doing general surgery. And now I was in, they really didn't have sports medicine at the time. This is back in the, in the early 80s. And um, uh, so this, this kind of evolved and uh, um, uh, I ended up uh, focusing on that for a good 30 years and that's how the career has gone. So, well, what's interesting, um, and, and I apologize for this, Dr. Jim, but I'm a little bit of a history buff and, and especially when it comes to history of fitness. And so I think it's, I think it's very important to point out that when you're doing that in the early eighties at the time, correct me if I'm wrong, but at the time in the seventies, especially wasn't the prevailing thought that strength training was actually bad for athletes. Didn't, didn't we have yeah. this belief that at one point that strength, so when, how did that evolve? How did that change? Well, that, that's very interesting. So a lot of sports science was developed in Europe, but uh, um, it used to be, let, let's say in the 50s or 60s, uh, for all of the Olympic games and world championships, people just kind of came out of the wood, woods and competed in that kind of thing. 
So um, there really was no training and there certainly was no strength training. And uh, little by little, uh, people started to realize that uh, they could improve their performance in other sports by doing weightlifting and strength training to as an adjunct to what their normal training regimes would be. And um, I recall a time when uh, there was a big debate in the 60s about whether or not this was ethical. Hmm. So, you know, if, if you were going to be pushing weights around and then go play football, that wasn't really fair. Um, and, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just thinking about today, this day and age, but right, sorry. Right. No, but literally today for virtually every sports, power sports, mixed sports, endurance sports, strength, strength training is an, is an active component of all training programs. So... Uh, you know, it's funny how these things evolve. And I would say that BFR training is kind of an offshoot of uh, strength training for, uh, for pretty much everybody. And one of the big advantages is that we use relatively light weights. So if standard lifting for hypertrophy, you're going for 70 to 80% of one rep max. And, you know, let's say, uh, three sets of six lifts or whatever. Um, what we do with uh, BFR training, it's more around 25 to 35% of one rep max. And it's usually three sets of 30 reps. And uh, that there's a number of things that happen with that. Uh, one is when we do it that way, we get a powerful fatigue signal. And we, we get it just so that, you know, the people fail in the last set. They just can't complete the 30 reps. And um, that failure signal is what prompts the adaptation. But because we've used light weights, uh, then there, you really don't get the muscle damage that you get when you're really lifting heavy. And also, you know, if you, if you end up, you actually can do more weight, more reps to failure because you're not sitting there wondering whether this 250 pounds you have over your head is, is going to fall on your foot or hurt your back or do something else. It's, you know, you're talking about having 50 pounds or 75 pounds over your head. So uh, that's no big deal to guide that bar down to, to where it's not going to hurt anything. And um, so uh, this ends up being uh, a much more time efficient way of training uh, to get to that failure point or that fatigue point that you really need to do for your most intense workouts. And uh, it, it's, it's safer as well. And because the damage isn't done, you recover quicker. So instead of, you know, normally, at least our athletes, they put about 48 hours between uh, maximal lifting sessions for uh, one, uh, you know, let's say upper body or something. And uh, uh, here you can, instead of, you know, every two days, you can do two days, two, two, two workouts a day. And so it really... Once you're doing that and recovering from it, then this building is accelerated and you just get a very uh, quick anabolic response. Well, on that note, and, and the reason why I want to take a step back and, and look at the totality of your career and how sports conditioning has evolved is I would make the argument you, you, you talked about in, in the, when you first introduced yourself that you want to do everything ethically possible to advance sports performance and advance human performance. And so if you look at, at the way we apply science today, I'm not not at all advocating the use of drugs or any of that, of, of uh, exogenous androgens or anything like that, not the use of performance enhancement. But when you look at how we use techniques like BFR or understanding recovery or compression, or when you look at all these things we understand about nutrition, does it seem like we've completely changed how we view athlete, like athletic preparation? Uh Maybe, but there's a big distinction. And, and this is really the key to all these things. Um, and that is physiologic manipulation versus pharmacological manipulation. Mm. So on one hand, you could give growth hormone or anabolics or whatever to, to see this, or you can use something like um, BFR training or uh, heavy lifting to elicit this anabolic hormonal response. And it's not just kind of, you know, 
choose your drugs or your weights or that kind of thing. When you're doing it physiologically, uh, there's all these feedback loops that make it safe for you. So you get away from any of the complications that you get from just uh, injecting whatever comes along. Well, well, thank you, doctor. That's exactly why I asked that question is I wanted to point out there's a huge difference between understanding, you know, for listeners, exogenous means taking it from outside the body. Endogenous means we take it, we produce it from within the body. And there's a huge difference between manipulating training variables or manipulating other lifestyle factors that can produce an anabolic response within the body and introducing it from outside. And so as we go into, I want to, I want to dive into a little bit deeper about blood flow restriction. And I want to stay right now that we, we don't know. I always make this point, doctor, on, on the podcast is we don't know definitively how this works. We have an idea based on observation, but we can't really give any definitive answers because we don't clearly know exactly how the body responds to certain training variables. But when we look at blood flow restriction, it the, the, the process of it restricts, what is it? Restricts venous flow out and maintains arterial flow in. Am I getting that right? Let's talk a little bit about the process of what's happening with the blood when we do it, when we, when we use a blood yeah. pressure, we use BFR. And, and it is a little complicated, but I'll try to, I'll try to make it smooth. So when you first put on um, an elastic cuff or a rigid cuff um, and you inflate it, uh, that uh, the, the pressure in the, in the inflatable area actually uh, forces in on the uh, extremity. And our extremities are basically a hydraulic system. So it's, it's liquids and solids and stuff, and they don't move. The only thing that can kind of move out of the way, so if, you, if you're sitting there and you're, you're squeezing a, an arm or something, the only thing that can get out of that space is blood. And it's at a lower pressure where you basically occlude the veins than a higher pressure where if you kept, kept on going, you would end up occluding the artery also. And, but then after that, you're just increasing pressure in the extremity and nothing moves. I mean, maybe you squeeze a little water out, but uh, basically you're not moving fat, you're not moving bone, you're not moving muscle. And uh, um, so that's what happens. So, but that's just at the beginning. Then the thing, and this is the key where uh, this rigid versus elastic thing comes in. And that is, let's say you do, you start doing exercise. And let's just say for the sake of argument, uh, uh, you're doing five pound arm curls. And uh, what happens is when you, when you flex your arm, you are, are stiffening the muscle in your forearms and in your bicep. And you're generating a pressure that then squeezes what's blood is in the distal arm past that venous obstruction. And when you have these things just right, you're really not influencing the arterial inflow. What you're doing is you're providing resistance for the venous outflow. And um, that resistance needs to be proportional to how much force is being generated by the muscles contracting. So if you, if you kind of think of this thing as a muscle pump, the muscle's sitting there and it's, it's pushing this bolus of blood back out through the veins. And um, it also pushes blood up past the artery. The, the artery is open, but um, you know, the, the veins have valves. So if blood goes out of the veins, it can't get back in. Mm -hmm. And so in this way, we create this circulation, um, but we've changed the character of it. So um, instead of, you can think of kind of a lazy river of venous blood going back. Now, all of a sudden we have periods where there's no venous flow and periods where there's very high venous flow. And so you, you've all almost made it more pulse tile. And the, so what of that is that this ends up being uh, a way of insufficiently delivering oxygen and nutrients to the working muscle. And so what happens is you start to develop a metabolic crisis in those muscles. And we're aware of those things by, you know, saying, oh, wow, you know, my, you know I'm starting to fatigue. My muscles are, are sore. And um, uh, this, this metabolic crisis then does a number of things. One is 
because you're lifting relatively light, you're using mostly uh, the first recruited muscle or the slow twitch muscle. Uh, but that then, because it's not getting the oxygen it needs to continue, those fibers fall out. And now you have, if you're going to continue the work, you have to get faster and faster twitch muscles. And before you know it, when you get to the point of fatigue or failure, you've contracted all the motor units in that, in that muscle. Like you do with standard heavy lifting, but with the heavy lifting, you do it all at once because you just need all those fibers gone to be able to lift the weight. And, so and that's, yeah, good. This is, a, this is a way of really getting um, all the fibers contracted. But then what happens is, is when they fatigue, uh, they're, what's happening in, inside the muscle cell or muscle fiber is that uh, it's running out of ATP or intercellular phosphates. It's running out of oxygen. The pH is dropping. And essentially, there's this disturbance of homeostasis, which does a number of things. One is, in itself, it upregulates uh, protein synthesis in, a, in an attempt to kind of fix this problem. But also we have nerve fibers, um, group three and four afferents, they're, they're sensory afferents. And what happens is they take this information from metaboreceptors and mechanoreceptors and they send it up to the brain. And one of the effects of that is there's cortical representation where you say, hey, I'm fatiguing. On the other hand, it also elicits a neurohormonal response and then starts uh, one of the things that's been documented is that uh, 15 to 30 minutes after a um, elastic BFR session, you have a very prompt and robust uh, secretion of growth hormone. And the only place growth hormone comes from is in the pituitary gland, and it has to be stimulated from the hypothalamus and the thalamus. So it's this afferent information from the muscle that goes up into the brain and produces this neuro -hor anabolic hormonal response that is documented as uh, growth hormone or endogenous growth hormone. And uh, that then goes to the liver and starts IGF-1 going off and uh, goes to the testes and secretes more testosterone. And all of this whole hormonal antibiotic cascade just uh, carries on. And now you have this systemic response coming around and it amplifies all of the local changes that were going on. So if a, any muscles that you used in the exercise are going to benefit, or any structures, tendons, tissues, all those things, are going to benefit from, um, there's been a local stimulus for upregulating protein synthesis, and now there's this anabolic systemic response that's coming along that amplifies that whole thing. And this whole thing again, because you didn't do very much damage, instead of having to kind of dig yourself out of a hole after a workout, you just start going right up from the get-go. And it's a very effective way of um, increasing strength and hypertrophy, if that's what you're interested in. And it also uh, produces a, uh, uh, it's a lipolytic hormonal milieu. So you end up breaking down a lot of fat and uh, you end up being leaner. So it's very common for people to, after 20 sessions, to have a 10 to 15% increase in, in strength and, uh, and be a lot leaner than they used to be. Well, well doctor, just so you know, it, it, I, I just wrote a book called Agents Intensity about how high intensity exercise really slows down or mitigates many of the effects of the aging process. And for listeners, what Dr. Jim just explained right there basically describes what I write about in my chapter on on how this type of tra on how strength training generally creates that anabolic cascade within the body. And I left out BFR specifically because I thought I was a little bit too it, it wasn't within the scope of what I was trying to write for consumers. And, and one of the wrote, one of the notes I wrote to myself and, and maybe it was something I, I saw in an interview that you did and I was reading through some of the research was basically what you're doing is you're accelerating acidosis which it which then re, then kind of creates that response that you're talking about. So is BFR safe for all all individuals? Absolutely. Uh, we we say nine to ninety, but it could be ten to hundred or whatever. Um, and just to amplify on one of the things that you said is this is the way the body adapts. 
But as we age, we can't do those really super heavy workouts anymore. Otherwise, we get hurt or some chronic injury we picked up, uh, you know, ends up not being able to tolerate those loads. So here is, we really think about this as anti-aging medicine, because once we get that hormonal cascade going, however we did it, you're, you're going you're gonna to get the benefit and keep everything, keep everything operational. As we age, it's not so much a question that our the structures just can't do it anymore. It's that the it's that the workouts that it takes to get that kind of thing is is lacking. So um, it's a key it's a key to unlocking that anti aging business. Well, exactly. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on because it does create that anabolic response. And from what I've read in the research, the body will continue to bruise. The body can produce. GH and IGF-1 and testosterone in the later years, it just needs the appropriate stimulus, correct? Right, exactly. And, and then, you know, well, let me just rephrase that a little bit and say, you know, a lot of this stuff hasn't been able to be studied. So we don't know that it's a complete lack of doing those workouts that produces the low growth hormone levels, or if there's something about the aging process that makes the pituitary not able to put out as much as they could. But one of the things that's clear is that when we do BFR workouts, we can really improve the, that growth hormone response. And so whether it's as vigorous as it would have been had you been 20, I'm not sure right now, uh, but it certainly is a good response and, you, and we get the same adaptation that we would have gotten earlier. Well, in going through the research for my book, doctor, I realized that when they do a lot of the research on, on older adults, many of them are from a relatively sedentary population, right? When they get a population of 60 to 70 year olds and they're going to do a training intervention, many of them don't have much of an exercise history. Yet, I think right. it's your generation, doctor, who's grown up since the 1970s of exercise. It's only been since the 1970s that exercise has been a part of our recreational habits. Because going back before right. 1970s, it really, we didn't have the commercial fitness center. We didn't have the Nautilus weight equipment. We didn't have all that. And it's only been the last 50 years or so. So do you think, and where I'm going with this is, do you think the research is going to catch up and look at people who are like yourself, who are fit in their, maybe they're, I don't want to age you, but they're fit. I'm just putting that you're probably over the age of 60. 60 but, 68 and a half. <laughs> but, but there are people like yourself who are fit and in their 60s Aren't you rewriting? Isn't your kind of generation rewriting what we understand about exercise and its effect on aging? Absolutely. You raise a very good point that the studies that were done were done on essentially sedentary people. And we now have many, many people who are exercising regularly in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. So, uh, and you know, we always had those unique individuals where they were you know, 85 and they were running a marathon or, or doing something, you know, that everybody says, I can't believe they're doing that. Yeah. Those are the few individuals that kept, kept, kept it going. And so uh, um, while I think the aging uh, situation is, is a bit of a down, downhill slide, uh, we can do a lot to adjust how steep that downhill slide is. And I think uh, without regular exercise, it gets pretty, it gets pretty steep. And uh, with, with regular exercise and particularly with BFR exercise, I think we can stave it off and, and uh, maybe have it flat for a good long while. Well, I was just about to pull out a phrase that we got, became familiar with last year and that's flatten the curve. As you were saying that, you I, thought, I, thought, I thought essentially BFR is a way to kind of shortcut and, and flatten the curve. Well, here's, here's something. You know, one of the increased risk factors for severe COVID disease is obesity, hypertension, um, uh, diabetes, and um, uh, cardiovascular disease. All of those things are fixed by uh, BFR. And so along with the vaccine, we'll do a whole lot better if we get the population fit. And Lord knows we're not, the American population is not fit no. at the moment. <laughs> well, and that's why I think I'm bullish. When I talk to friends of mine in the fitness industry, I've known people who've shut down their studios. I've known people who started online training businesses 
But I am very bullish in the long run because I firmly believe, doctor, that once we see the data, just as you mentioned, those of us that were fit and, and exercised, if we caught COVID, we got sick. And of course, there are outliers who unfortunately passed as a result of it, but they're always outliers, right? But when you look at the data, when they, and when you when you come, when you look at the big population data, it's going to become clearly evident that those of us who make exercise and health and wellness a priority are going to have weathered this storm much better than the rest of the population. Is that and, and I, that, I'm, this is just me That's, just observing it and making an anecdotal guess with no specific I, data. I totally agree with you, and it's even more important in. You know, it, it, let's let's say in the 80 and 90 year old group, maybe it's just that the immune system's wearing out, and that's what the main problem is. But for the 40 to 60 year olds that have had trouble, almost invariably they've had this combination, this metabolic syndrome, which is overweight, um, high blood pressure, uh, inadequate glucose control, and uh, cardiovascular disease. And so to start kind of tying this together, what do you think? I mean, is it is it the increase of anabolic hormones or is it like mitochondrial density or is it just the overall metabolic stress? What is it about blood flow restriction that really could help slow down or mitigate the effects of aging? What makes it like the, the ideal, ideal anti-aging? You talked about it a little bit, but there's so many variables in there. I didn't know if there, you're able to put your finger on yeah. any one of them. But here's, here's one way to think about this. You know, our, 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 the cells in our body are continually turning over and they turn over in a manner that's associated with how they're used. So if you're sedentary and you're eating more calories than you burn, you're gonna, your body's going to morph into something where there's a lot of fat and not a lot of muscle. And um, the bones are going to deteriorate. The blood vessels are going to deteriorate. Everything kind of says, well, I'm not needed anymore, you know, so adios. And um, that's where regular exercise comes in because it provides a stimulus to try to deal with the uh, challenges that your body sees. So um, this regular exercise basically keeps, keeps everything tuned up. And then there's another aspect of all this, and that is, is that there's uh, a very good paper that I can, uh, I'll email you after the show, uh, that shows that um, uh, VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor, um, HIF1 alpha or hypoxyl inducible factor 1A, and then uh, various nitric oxide synthase uh, enzymes are all upregulated doing a, an elastic BFR workout compared to just doing the workout by itself. And, you know, it, it's a bit of a jump, but you could think of this as Drano for the arteries, hmm. because this is the way to get healthy endothelium in the, in your blood vessels. And so a, one of the sayings that we have is you're only as old as your arteries. Well, here we have something that has been shown to enhance the repair and maintenance of endothelial function and, uh, and your blood vessels. So combine the idea of, well, BFR has been shown to enhance muscle, to enhance blood vessels, to enhance bone, to enhance tendons, and to actually enhance nerve function. So everything that gets involved in us moving around is enhanced by a regular BFR program. And all of this stuff contributes to uh, basically flattening that curve and, and, uh, and basically being able to maintain function well into advanced years. And, and the, the other thing that pops to mind, doctor, and I, I made a note of this in, in doing the preparation, is BDNF because doesn't this? I mean, when you when you get a disruption of of the metabolic of, of the metabolic systems in the muscle, creating acidosis. I know there's a correlation between lactate, IGF one, um, GH, and levels of BDNF. Is that something that's been studied? And for listeners, that's brain derived neurotrophic factors. That's something that's been studied with BFR. It, it has not, and it's a study aching to be done. It it gets a little complicated because. Um, you know, it, it's one thing to draw blood before and after a, a workout, but uh, where this BDNF is probably working is inside the brain. And, and so 
um, it's going to be a little hard to tap people's cerebral spinal fluid to uh, measure this stuff. So, um, but it, it, it would be a very interesting study to do. And, and I'll bet you, doing, I'll yeah, bet I'll you it's okay. All I'm doing, doctor, is connecting the dots because I've seen the studies that hit high intensity interval training is related to elevated levels of BDNF. And so I would think that if this is creating some type of metabolic disruption in a shorter period with less intensity than hit, then it should or theoretically should have the same response for stimulating uh, uh, the, we, the protein. We even do, we do hit workouts with damn bands on. Oh, it wow. Just amplifi- it just amplifies the whole process. And, um, uh, there's a colleague of mine at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, uh, Gregor Millet. And uh, right now he's conducting a study using hit intervals and, uh, and be strong bands. Oh, wow. So, that sounds, now the, the final point to wrap this up, the, the use of the bands, when I was looking, when I was going through the stuff, the, the, doing the research, are they only, are they best used on extremities? Are there any ways, ways to apply them to muscles, to apply the pressure to muscles on the torso? Are they best used like at the thighs, the calves, and with the arms? Yeah, that, that's one of the things to be safe. You always put the bands in the same place, high, okay. high up on the arm and high up on the thigh. And, but the good news is with the systemic response, let's, let's say you're doing bench press. Well, the, you know, your triceps are, pro, are, get, are, are distal to the band, but you're using your pecs too. And, and their blood flow ought to be just fine. But then when you get this systemic response coming around, any muscles that were involved in the exercise, whether they were proximal or distal to the band, are going to get this hormonal bath that's going to help them get better. So um, that's one of the really cool things about uh, elastic BFR is, is we get this systemic response and, and any muscles that are used, core muscles, whatever, um, are, are going to get that amplification. Well, I'm excited. I, I, it's one of these things, doctor, where, like I said, years ago, I heard this and I thought it, I filed away as like, oh, that's interesting. It's an interesting technique, but it sounded way too advanced to be done in a commercial gym, which is where as a personal trainer, I lived. And I thought, because it first came out of physical therapy, correct? This, this, this protocol first evolved from physical therapy, right? Well, the, um, the American copies of what they thought they were doing in Japan uh, did come through the physical therapy or the rehab setting. Um, but, um, for years, this has been used to augment training in Japan and primarily to, to, uh, augment training. So, um, it was another one of the mistakes or misconceptions that, uh, the, um, Europeans and Americans had about this whole thing. Well, it, it, to point out, I think, and this is important because you've studied the winter sports, the, one of the most popular high intensity protocols that everybody knows by name also came out of Japan, the speed skaters in the 90s with Dr. Tabata's study, correct? So I think that, mm-hmm. I mean, that's what I've learned is that we really, if we really want to understand physiology, I've studied the Russians, like I've studied Verkoshansky and Zatsyorsky's work, and I've interviewed Michael Yesis before about his, his work with the Russians. And I think for, for listeners, if you really want to understand physiology, Sometimes we have to look off our shores and go look at what other people around the world are doing. Has that been your experience, doctor, especially working in elite sports? Absolutely. Um, one of the things to say is that um, there's actually a specific example of a Japanese uh, world record holder and uh, gold medalist speed skater um, mm-hmm. who, who ended up uh, uh, using um elastic BFR exclusively for his, for his strength training. And then basically just skated and you should see this guy's thighs. I mean, they're just monstrous and, uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's just amazing. And, so, and now I just want to work. I want to say for listeners, you've graciously extended a 20% discount for your bands. And if, if, if listeners, if somebody buys a band, if a general consumer buys a band, how can they learn how to use them? I mean, what resources do you have available that can teach people how to use it safely? Yeah. Um, well, firstly, there's a quick start guide that comes with every system. And, uh, but we also have a free app that people can get off the web that uh, goes through the basics of where to put the bands and all that sort of thing. It's uh, app at gobestrong.com. 
And um, uh, then we also have these certification courses, more and more of them coming online that will, uh, the, the main certification course gets pretty heavy into the science and theory behind all this stuff, but it does address some training regimes. Uh, but kind of our next deal is to set up a series of what kind of the basic workouts are for a variety of different uh, people and demographics or uh, particularly interested in a particular sport. Um, so uh, that, that stuff's coming. And then doctor, what's the primary website for people that want to, I'll have it down below in the show notes, but I always like to give you the opportunity to give it a little bit of plug. If people want to find out more about what you're doing and where they can get your bands, where, where should they go? Uh, it's be strong dot training. So the letter B, the word strong, no spaces, dot training. And uh, that's, we're good to go. And there, cool. there's a web store on there, but there's also a lot of information on the, on the website. Well, I just want to say, I've really, the, as I was digging into this, I was really excited to speak to you, like I said, because I, now that we have these products, now that we have your, your bands available and we have a better understanding of how to apply it, I'm actually looking forward to digging in a little bit and giving it a try. And I'll give you guys some feedback in, in kind of my experience with it. Absolutely. Stay in touch and let me know how it goes.